integrated information theory, a form of magic. We'll be looking at it, continuing with Bergson's holographic theory and its implications. This is my second look at Tononi's IIT. Did one in 2018. I think I kind of missed an element of the analysis, misconstrued something uh, in the analysis of IIT. I think generally the thing was correct, but uh, just a warning there. In any case, it's become even more of a thing with Christoph Cox advocacy. Just a few of the uh, recent interviews with Christoph on uh, IIT, where he's advocating IIT, to include his new book, Then I Am Myself the World, which kind of relates to the um, video below at DMT left me perplexed for days. Uh, a mystical experience, shall we say, that uh, is giving him some uh, food for thought. So I thought we'd look at Cox's arguments for IIT. Has he added more heft? Well, let's see. I'm going to key off this interview. It has fairly extensive, uninterrupted summary of IIT's rationale, just given in February 2025. At the start of the interview, Christoph makes it quite clear that he views large language models as not conscious, like ChatGPT, that computations are not sufficient for consciousness. He gives arguments along the line of, shall we say, a simulation of a rainstorm will not get you wet. Simulations aren't real, real things. So then he follows. The theory starts with the one thing we are sure of, namely consciousness, he says. The only thing I have acquaintance with is my conscious experience, the way you feel when I'm in love, when I'm angry, when I'm in pain. These are all specific ways of feeling. So the challenge is to explain how these come about. These feelings exist intrinsically from me, and they have a particular structure. They are the way they are. And now I have got a toothache, and it feels a very specific way. But it's also very different. It's different from every other possible experience I could be having. Note, of course, the constant emphasis of the hard problem in terms of the way you feel, the way things feel like. Now he goes on, he, he describes the character of this visual experience, the objects on the desk, the donuts, the color. All this has to be explained. But as I just said, is this visual experience also just how it feels? So always we have the conflation of the origin of affect, of pain, of the hotness of the tea kettle there, etc., with the origin of the image of the external world, the visual experience, the auditory experience, the, the, tactile, the tact, tactile experience. He goes on, start with these five. Any one conscious experience must be part of this character. Now, he didn't quite make the five clear in this particular talk, but what he meant was this uh, characteri characterization by Tononi, who employs five undeniable attributes of conscious experience, these phenomenological axioms, intrinsic existence, composition, information, integration, exclusion. This is far from how I would uh, describe the uh, undeniable attributes of conscious experience, but nevertheless, going on. How can I put that in some operational way that I can look at a system, a mechanism, like my brain or a computer chip, and ascertain whether, whether this mechanism, where these neurons are, where these neurons are on, these neurons are off, is explaining something. And for that, it goes back to the notion of what exists. And it says, what exists ultimately is what has causal power on other things. So, this would be like trying to figure out how a radio or an electric motor work by disabling or enabling very various components, turning on vacuum tubes, turning them off. Um, just starting to put this thought form in your, um, in this nature of the problem in your mind. Continuing. In physics, we know something exists because it has a gravitational force or electric charge. It attracts or it repels goes back to Plato. A measure of a thing's existence is how much causal power it exerts. And it doesn't 
if it doesn't have any causal power, I don't need to bother with it. And so IT looks at a specific thing like the brain of an animal or a CPU of a computer, and it tries to study it. Let me look at the different elements of the system. And if I turn those two neurons on and those two neurons off, how much am I going to affect the system in the next step, and the next step, and the next step afterwards? So, again, in the context of our radio or our electric motor, imagine a later culture that's inherited our culture. Uh, with respect to the electric motor, it has no knowledge of electric fields, magnetic fields, their interaction, and there's no Nikola Teslas around or with respect to the radio. No knowledge of radio waves or even radio stations. But it's going to try to figure out the radio, the radio or how the motor works. What is IIT's procedure going to achieve as far as actual understanding of these devices? I'll leave it there for now. To continue, you can formalize this in a formal definition of causal power. How much causal power? How much power does this system have to influence its own future or to be influenced by its past? And then he notes here, Ray, the concept of intrinsic causal power. It's the power to act on itself, not on something else. A piece of cake there on the table does not have a lot of intrinsic causal power, he notes. Continuing, a brain we could study. We can see when one state deterministically will always go into two other states. And from one state, it goes into four other states. And in each of these cases, I can compare or compute the conditional probability matrix, which essentially gives me a measure of causal power. How much does this system have the power to influence and to be influenced by the recent past? Now, again, this is just restating the same problem of analysis looking at the radio, looking at the uh, electric motor. I'm going to describe a, a matrix, a probability matrix uh, for these devices. Then he says, and you can gradually, and you can quantify that by this number called phi. When it's zero, the system has no integrated information. It's not information in the Shannon sense, he notes. It's much closer to causal power. The ability of the system to influence self, itself and also its complexity. So now having done our causal power analysis and probability, conditional probability matrix, we can assign a phi number to each device, which is in ID an index of how conscious each is. Now, that seems a little strange because one would doubt that uh, there's much consciousness in an electric motor or a radio. Interestingly, in this particular interview with Brian Keating, he asked Christoph about Scott Aronson's critique. Aronson had shown that one could simply arrange a large number of logic gates, I think logic gates, but, and, they, uh, and achieve a large, such a large phi number, the system must be considered conscious. And Aronson was shocked when Tononi bit the bullet, as Scott said, saying, yes, it would be conscious. So answering Keating, Christoph simply sort of went around the question, said this would be a matter for future empirical study. Okay, so simply discard the implication of Aronson. It does not change this. IIT is just a strange a complicated, a poor substitute for a dynamic theory of a device. For example, the brain, any brain. It's just as poor as any theory created by these guys, our later culture who knows nothing about the physics of any of this stuff, using an IIT-like procedure. That is, it'd be just as poor a theory as there is of the radio or of the uh, electric motor. IIT will say, but IIT is not a theory of the brain, just of whether something is conscious. They're still going to say it's a theory of consciousness, and this is what I'd say. How do you have a theory of consciousness without knowing what the role of the brain is? 
And I think it could be argued here that there's a good number of current theories of consciousness that leave you scratching your head when you ask, well, what is the brain's actual role? This seems especially true for idealist and, and panpsychic theories. I think Castro, uh, Fagin, Hoffman. I know I've just read Fagin's book, and that's precisely where I was left. So I might be getting in trouble here, but I think at least it's an interesting question to ask when one reads these theories of consciousness. In any case, this is all a reflection of the strange dilemma expressed in the AI versus Searle controversy, where Searle says the biology is important, it's critical, but he cannot say why the biology is important, why this is so. So because of this, AI just dismisses this claim and says all one needs is computations, computer, or, uh, until, until, until proven otherwise. We don't need to worry about biological dynamics. So now IIT rejects the computations, as we've seen Christoph saying, saying causal power is important, but still has no idea why the causal power is important and still couldn't answer Searle's question, or, or um, why is the biology important? Again, IIT has no more idea why their causal power of the brain is important, whatever number they come up with, with their phi number, than these guys would on why their causal power model that they came up with of an electric motor is in any way important for how it generates force. The problem of IIT as a theory of consciousness, I think, is uh, in this in this context is easier shown in the, with uh, in the context of the difference with respect to Bergson. So with IIT and its causal power derived from the interaction of components, we still simply have magic as to this, the origin of the image of the external world, the coffee cup being stirred with a spoon, also known as our experience, our sentience. The same question we can ask, how from neurochemical flows, no matter how much causal power do we derive that coffee cup, that experience? Same thing for a whole massive set of logic gates. In either case, we need some form of magic to explain how we get that image of the external world, our experience from those technical structures. Now, Bergson, we've seen along with J.J. Gibson, removed the magic. They envisioned a very concrete dynamical device and to have gone through it obviously many times before, it's interesting to throw it into this IIT framework for analogously to our discovering of how an electric motor would work or how a uh, radio works, we have to embed these devices within a field. For radios at least, it's embedded in, or radio is embedded in a waves, radio waves. Electric generator, we have to start with this embeddedness and I'll just say the magnetic and electric, dielectric components of the ether, the ether field. So we're embedding the brain within a holographic field, the same field taken as a holographic field, and that field has to be indivisibly transforming. That is, we're not invoking a discrete instant by instant, discrete instant by, by, uh, instant by discrete instant, model of time, but an indivisible flow. And then we're invoking holographic reconstruction, where the reconstructive wave passes through the hologram plate, and the object wave rising to the eye is specific to the original source of that interference pattern, in this case from the cup. The source now being seen in three dimensions out there. So the brain is now seen as taking the part of that reconstructive wave. The brain acts as a modulated reconstructive wave passing through the holographic field and is specific to a source within the field. Now, as an image in the coffee cup, the stirring spoon. And the invariant structure of the event, this is Gibson stuff, that drives the modulation pattern of the brain, what Gibson would say is the resonating pattern of the brain. All those invariance laws structuring that event. Again, because we're talking a concrete biochemical dynamic system, uh, the chemical dynamics 
underlying those chemical flows of the brain specify the scale of time. In our normal scale, it's a buzzing fly. His wings are blur. If we take LSD, which I've argued acts on the 5-HT2AR receptor by via electronic induction, that's raising the oscillation of the entire neural mass, then the whole perception, the time scale is going to slow down. We'll have a buzzing, I mean, a hair-length fly barely flapping his wings. And the spoon stirring will slow down. The swirls of the coffee will slow down. The clinking sound will slow down. Now, in this framework, affect naturally falls out. I've discussed elsewhere. You have to solve this origin of the image of the external world first. And that's by understanding the nature of the device and the field which is in, in which it's embedded. This, by the way, this invariant structure is the information, the not Shannon-like information, to which the brain is actually resonating for Gibson, but which IIT is utterly uninterested. So we have a concrete device that accounts for our image of the external world, indeed intrinsically causal, hardly requiring IIT's causal power framework. There's no other concrete, non-magical model that I know of, but again, analogous to our electric motor or our radio, we have to start with the proper field in which this device is embedded before we can begin to understand it. Again, in this particular interview with Ryan Keating, Christoph says AIs cannot be conscious. They have no phi value, which is curious because you would think the machine would get some phi value, but maybe he's just looking at the abstraction of the um, software. I'm not sure, but that's what he says. But he says AIs will do anything intellectually, cognitively that, cognitively that humans can do, which is interesting because Keating describes a study he was running where they, they tried to feed uh, an LLM, maybe ChatGPT, uh, all the data on the uh, perihelion of Mercury such that uh, they could come up with, they would th have thought uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity, curved space time, and it couldn't do it. In other words, here is a piece of uh, human thinking that uh, they, the AIs couldn't do. But uh, this didn't move Christoph. So fundamentally, what Christoph is saying is he thinks cognition has no need of consciousness. Cognition has no need of consciousness. Just a couple of my contra views and videos on this. I think it absolutely has need of consciousness. Cognition requires True cognition requires consciousness. To me, this no consciousness needed for cognition position is an index as to how misguided IIT really is. So, again, take a look at this book. Much more of the whole theory in here uh, on uh, Gibson, Bergson, and the whole notion of consciousness and intelligence. So, next we'll see. Till then, signing off.